What a glorious day it is. God has given us another beautiful day. And uh, as we come to him today, let us remember that he has given us mercy. We deserve nothing, but he gave everything to us. And that's the title of my message today, Mercy Personified, from 1 Peter 2, 4 through 12. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today to look at the glory of your scriptures, Let us know, dear Heavenly Father, that the scriptures and only the scriptures are correct in our lives. We give you the glory, dear Heavenly Father, and know that you will teach us the right way and the right things if we but bow our minds to the love of your word and to prayer. We have many things to pray for, Lord, as we pray for all those that have been destitute in in the last... uh, couple months, the shooting in Vegas, the uh, shootings here even in, in our area, the hurricanes, dear Lord, and the soldiers that have just recently died in Niger. We lift them all up to you, dear Heavenly Father, and the families that are left behind. But we thank you, dear Lord, that your mercy, if they are faithful to you, they stand with you today in glory. And we give you the glory for everything that's in our lives because we deserve nothing and have received everything. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Obedience to Christ is shown as paramount to love and living in Christ. His requirements are not burdensome but easy as we yoke together in Christ. My response to Jesus is the operative understanding. How do you respond to Jesus and his word? From my faith, I respond with obedience that comes from that faith and of which I then receive the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit who does renew and regenerate us. Sounds too tough for many. As many in the world today would have to leave this world in their minds and accept Jesus Christ and become new and made over and live for Jesus Christ, which means we can't live for the world. It's too tough for them. Why is it too tough? Because some do not want to obey and others do not want to obey as it is written. I heard Brother Michael Youssef this morning say we need to remember that the word of God is the truth. 
We all have opinions, but whose opinion is correct? But only the word of God is truth. And so today we need to stand strong in the word of truth. The story has been told of a mother who sought from Napoleon the pardon for her son. The emperor said it was the man's second offense. And justice demanded his death. I don't ask for justice, said the mother. I plead for mercy. But the emperors said, he does not deserve mercy. Sir, cried the mother, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask. Well then, said the emperor, I will show mercy. And her son was saved. Notice that we did not deserve the mercy of God. God so loved the world that he did give his only begotten son. You see, God gave his son. As we remember the story of Abraham and him taking his son Isaac to be crucified uh, on that altar to be uh, given back to God, Abraham reasoned that God was going to raise his son back from the dead. Well, it was a pre-knowledge uh, of Jesus Christ who came and died for us and then he was risen again. All for mercy. Jesus bore everything on that cross. Every pain, every slap, every insult for one thing and that was to give you mercy, to pay your debts in full. We have a new way of living and today he calls us a holy priesthood, and that's point one. We are a holy priesthood. We are the house of God. Not this building, but we are the house of God. As, Jeter told, as Jesus told Peter that on his confession of faith, he was going to build his house and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. The gates of hell cannot prevail against us because Jesus Christ lives within us. It is Jesus who is taking care of us because we are his holy house. In the house is all manner of people needed to make the temple of God thrive. We are that holy priesthood that belongs to the temple, the spiritual temple of God. First, a priest has direct access to God. Do we have direct access to God today? Amen. We certainly do. In our prayers, you're praying to God for mercy in many circumstances. As mercy for those that are sick. For mercy to those that are having problems because of Harvey and Irma. And now Nate for those mercy for those out in Vegas that were killed and their families that were left behind. We ask God for mercy in the lives of those left behind. But God gave us mercy in the fact that he now has created in us a new life in the kingdom of God. Secondly, a priest represented the people of God back unto God. We do so through many gifts given us. I think that with the many lists of gifts given to the church through the word of God, that we ought to respect all the gifts and understand that we have not been given just some of the gifts or that some of the gifts are not needed in our churches. Now, we don't all have all the gifts, and all churches don't have all the gifts, but the fact is these gifts are used in the churches for the glory of God, not for the glory of man. If we love Jesus, we will have all that is sufficient for our needs. Here's a, a God's list of what a church needs from head to toe. And uh, I added a little few more uh, verses because it's a wonderful reading to set us up for it. In Romans 12, 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's what? Mercy. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Notice that it's a measure of faith he has given you, each one of us, a measure of faith. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not ha all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now notice he didn't say one person had the responsibility to do all of these things. We have many members here and each member has a gift and we need to use those gifts so that the church will be united in faith and glory through Jesus Christ. We represent to God as priests those around us and those around us unto God because of our many gifts. We can see that we are complete because of the gifts of God. We use them to glorify our risen Savior. He has given each of us a task to do. And you need to do it because he has given you a gift. Now in Colossians 3, 11 through 16, it says, Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Amen. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Isn't it amazing how many different churches have been split because two people can't agree and then they can't forgive each other? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. As a, what has the Lord forgiven you? Everything. That's what mercy is all about. You didn't deserve it, but he gave it to you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful let the word of Christ dwell on you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Now, we have sung many songs today. Did you have gratitude in your heart as you sang them? Did you look at the words and say, man, God really loves me? Because, you see, God loved you so much that he put his son on a cruel cross. But he loved him so much that he raised him so that we also may have eternal life. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, we get some more of the, of the gifts. Verse 11, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. To prepare God's people for what? works of service. It's your service that he de desires. It is your service that he is teaching all of us for. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I so wish that that would be happening in our churches today, but it seems like our churches are becoming more and more fractured 
as we turn around with opinions and things that aren't in the Bible and say, geez, if you don't do this, you don't get to go to heaven. If you don't do it this way, you don't get to go to heaven. So as we look at these things, the whole measure of the fullness of Christ comes to us in the unity that we have together. Then it says we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth, doing what? Speaking the truth. You must speak it only. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So as we take all the gifts and put them together here today, one might have encouraged someone, someone might do the singing, someone might lead to this, and someone might be doing that. Some might give, some might be preaching, some might be teaching. We turn around and realize that not everybody here today is going to do the same job. If that be the case, we'd all be standing up here and talking to an empty auditorium because we'd all be preachers. And that isn't what God's desire is. Thirdly and lastly, the priests bring gifts on behalf of the people to the altar. God accepted the gifts with favor placed upon the altar. We are to bring gifts unto God on behalf of the church, for the church, placed upon the altar of the church, that the glory of the church might go forth. A church cannot thrive unless gifts are used and gifts of love are given. We, the saved of God, are the church and are built under one head to be the representatives of Christ to the world. We represent each other to God through our lives, our gifts, and our prayers, and remaining steadfast. In Ephesians 2, 20 through 22, it says, Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I think that's extremely important to remember that God lives in each of us by the spirit. Too often we have a, well, I get this gift and it's just a little bit better. I get this gift and it's just a little bit better. And so whose opinion's right? Well, it says here they're all together there so that we become a dwelling in which God can live in each of us. The Holy Spirit lives within the people and makes us one for the glory of Christ, who also lives within us. I hope you don't think you survive by your own merit, because, you see, none of us has merit to stand before God and say, I deserve mercy. Because if it was deserved, it wouldn't be mercy. There's nothing we can do to make God love us all the more. So part two is you have received mercy. How did you become qualified for that mercy? How did you become qualified for that mercy? We are saved by grace. The word grace is kind of a synonym for mercy. God's redemption at Christ's expense. We are saved by grace through faith. Not by works, lest any man boast. And so in our faith, in the, what God has given us, I have a new life to live for Jesus Christ. I live a new life, not because of anything I do, but because of what Jesus has done for me. And then I turn around and because I love Jesus, I will do everything he asks of me. It is not what church I attend or what things I do or how I do them, but I do in accordance with the word of God written down 
not watered down, not sidestepped, not added to, but I do as the word of God says, and that is the only reason that I live for Jesus Christ, because I take the words of Christ as the truth. Now, rejecting Jesus will cause one to end up in hell. Rejecting the words. We cannot reject the words nor take them and place them into something other than what Jesus meant for them. All roads do not lead to heaven. Only one road, and that is through Jesus Christ, him dead, buried, and resurrected. That is the only road of faith that we can come to God in glory and that the mercy is then spread out over us because of our faith. Now, how hideous does it sound when people end up in hell? You see, there, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and unquenchable fire deep in dark darkness. In John 3, 19 through 20, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light, so fear that his deeds will be exposed. And so when, and when they get judged unto hell by their lack of faith, they will live forever in that darkness because that's exactly where they want to live. So I ask you, what do you think mercy is? The response of truth is that mercy is the mitigation of circumstances, even when we do not deserve it. Mercy of our sins is like those poor folk in, in Texas and even here in Florida, and now we add Biloxi and Mississippi and Louisiana to that list who were trapped, say, in deep waters and had no way to get into safety. And somebody comes by with a boat and says, Here, get on board. I'll take you to safety. That's, that's the mercy of God. They didn't deserve it. They were there. They had no way out. But the boat provided a way to get to shore. Jesus did just that. As we were destined for hell... As soon as you become the age of awareness, according to uh, Isaiah 7, 15, when you became aware that you sinned, you then were destined for hell and had need of a Savior. Jesus mitigated many circumstances, even while here on earth, to prove that he is the one that mitigates circumstances and that he alone has the power over everything. The blind see. The lame walk, the mute speak, and the deaf hear. Jesus mitigated those circumstances. These people didn't deserve it, but they walked up to Jesus and said, What would you do for me? What would you have me do for you? And they'd say, Well, I want to see, or I want to hear, I want to see, I want to speak. Now, he also told of the man who was forgiven much. Some commentators say as well as much over a million dollars. And he was forgiven the debt. And then he went out and saw somebody who owed him just a few bucks. And he put that man in prison because he owed him just a few bucks. Well, he was forgiven much. Why shouldn't he have forgiven much as well? See, he, mercy was given but not received. That's the same as it is today when people know that Jesus Christ died for them, that his blood was put on Calvary for the simple purpose of forgiving your sins, and then they turn around and reject it. I'm going to live my way, or I'm going to try to get to, I'm going to get to heaven my way. Well, my friends, there is no other way. In Romans 11, 30-32, just as you were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, 
So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Nobody's so far gone that they can't come to God and say, God, forgive me. Nobody is so evil that God can't forgive them. Now you say, what about Satan? Well, Satan's already had his judgment. John 16, 11 says, Satan has been judged to hell. Once you're judged to hell, all those people in hell would certainly love to uh, ask for forgiveness and be led into heaven, but it's too late then. Paul makes it very clear. Remember Paul, that he was the chief of all sinners. And he acted in disbelief and ignorance concerning the hate that he showed for those who had faith. However, God showed him mercy and used him mightily for the glory of God. God will give mercy to all who ask. Third thing today is that we are aliens and strangers. Now, some of us are a little stranger than others, and that's okay. Because as long as you're strange for the Lord, praise God in your lives. I can say without question that I'm not at home here because, you see, I belong to another life in Christ Jesus. I belong in heaven. That is my home. And so I live here as an alien and as a stranger. Sin is removed from the city of God. If you find the city coming down, the new Jerusalem, sin is removed from all the glory of God. In fact, there are 12 gates to that city, and at each gate there are angels making sure no evil can come within. God wants to make sure that we have a perfect place to live. My citizenship is in heaven. That's where I have been reborn. Here in America, if you're born here, you're a citizen here. But if you weren't born here, you came, you had to be naturalized. You had to go through the process. Well, to get to heaven, you have to go through the process of being reborn into Jesus Christ. When we are reborn, we become citizens, not of this world, but of heaven. Therefore, we are aliens and strangers here going through this world, understanding that this world holds nothing for me, that my whole life is in heaven. My whole treasures are being laid up in heaven. So when I get there, they're waiting for me. The glory I have can only come from Jesus Christ. It says in Ephesians 2.19, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Aren't you glad you're a member of God's household? Praise God, you have been born again into a living hope, one that cannot be destroyed nor taken from us. And therefore, we are strange to this world. They think it very silly that we get up on Sunday morning and come here to worship God. Because after all, God doesn't exist. There is no hell, so I don't have to worry about going to hell. I can just live my life in sin and then just boom, nothing. Well, my friends, I'm sorry. We were created by God, for God. And we have been redeemed by God through his son, Jesus Christ. When I came up out of that water, from my faith, I confessed and repented and I became immersed. And when I came up out of that water, I was no longer a citizen of this world. My citizenship is in heaven. I have washed the old man away. I have washed the old world out of my life. We cannot live as the world does and expect to go to heaven. We find in Ephesians 5, 1 through 5, 
Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So you must become an alien and a stranger to this world and not use the words they use, not live the life they live. You must live the life of Jesus Christ who lives in you because it is no longer I who lives, it is Jesus who lives within me, Once I accept him as my personal savior. We need to get that through our heads that it's not this world that satisfies us. It's the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ that satisfies us. And we will live forever in eternity with Jesus. We're not going to live forever in eternity here. There's a song out that says, you can't live for here forever. Now you may not go up there, but you can't live here forever. The fact is, you have a choice. Because you're not going to live here forever, you must give God the glory. As the team comes, you have to understand one thing. you got a choice. Accept the mercy of God. Accept the mercy of Jesus Christ. You didn't deserve it. All you got to do is accept it. It's been done for you. Someone hands you a check for a million dollars and you say, oh, no, I don't want that. What do you got to do? You got to reach out and say, thank you. Take it and cash it. That's the way it is with eternal life. God has given it to you. He says, here's eternal life. All you have to do is reach out, take it, and say, I believe it. I believe in what you're telling me. Just faith. And from that faith will come obedience. You can't have any obediences prior to faith. That is for certain because they didn't mean nothing. They're just obediences. To what? A church. You must have obedience to Jesus Christ. Give him the glory today. The obedience he tells us is to stand up and confess him before men. Come down here today, and if you have never done that, come down and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then you repent and say, I'm not going to live like I used to because I'm no longer part of this world. I'm an alien and a stranger. And then you wash the old man away to become new. You become a naturalized citizen of heaven because you have washed the old man away. Then you stand firm every day. You go out into the world and the world says, I want to tell you a funny story. Is it? Is it a clean joke? I ask them today, is it a clean joke? Well, uh, I don't know. And I said, well, then I don't want to hear it. They look at you awful funny. But it says there shall be no coarse joking. Got to keep a tight ring in your tongue. A couple weeks from now, Peter's going to talk about that. But as we give God the glory today, you must become an alien and a stranger in this world. If you've given your life to Christ, you need to start working on that. That's each and every job, every day we got that job, to live a new day in Christ.